Okay, so um, there's three parts to this talk. I'll be giving the first part. I'll be going through it relatively quickly to give Hans time to go to the second part. So first we'll just take a quick look at Boost Histogram and Hans will go into more detail into um, all the different things that it provides. And then we'll finish with the first um, public demo that lasts longer than 10 seconds of um, Hist. All right. So, um, and the, hopefully a binder link should be working now. I have this open in, in a binder as well. Okay. And please let me know if I need to, uh, to change anything. Okay. And this is just, just the setup, fairly standard setup. If you've been using, um, you can use Binder or you can, if you've been using Conda, since a lot of these talks have been using Conda, hopefully you have that already set up and you can just pull it out there. The interesting things, of course, is that we'll have Boost Histogram, the current release, which uh, came out yesterday, and then um, a few other uh, requirements from the scikit-hip stack. Okay, and we'll start just by importing our standard things. And uh, if you've if you give a, a talk, this is a really handy uh, setting for talks. All right, so, and I will be going through this quite quickly and, and we'll be really going into more detail for the most part. Um, so, but if you wanna see a, a general overview that's aimed for a technical audience, but not for uh, a uh, high energy physics audience, there's a video here on YouTube from SciPy. So if you just click that link, that will take you to the SciPy video where I give, I give a uh, pre-recorded talk. So, um, the Python ecosystem, that's why I don't like having text on the slide. Uh, there's really not a, a good histogram for Python. We have uh, a histogramming uh, operation in, in NumPy, but it's limited, especially to what we're used to seeing in HEP. And uh, it kind of leaves us with just root and root histograms. So let's take a look at what a, an actual histogram object would, would look like. So we're going to take a look at boost histogram, and then we'll step back and sort of see how it works. So I'm just going to make one. So here's the boost histogram library. I make a histogram. I put in an axis. And you see I get a histogram object there. Like root, we can fill this later. So I have this, this data set that I made up here, and I'm just going to fill it in a million points. And then I can just perform operations on that histogram. So for example, I can sum. You'll see that I get the value right here. Um, and I can also ask for the flow bins to be active during the sum, in which case I get the sum with the flow bins. So it has flow bins just like root does for underflow and overflow. Um, and then for plotting, um, I can just take the uh, axes object and use the centers from that and um, the, take the widths as well. So I have all these nice properties on axes. Um, and then I have this hist. Uh, this histogram here, which has a view of its data. In fact, it behaves nicely like a nice Python object. I can just get rid of that view and that still works. Okay, because it follows the buffer protocol for Python. But from now on, let, we can be lazy and just hand this to uh, matplot uh, MPL HEP. MPL HEP supports histograms natively and even gives you a nice, uh, your standard nice style for a HEP style histogram. Um, and it takes these boost histogram objects. Um, natively. Okay, so that's sort of what a histogram looks like. So unlike root, um, histograms are really um, basic, made up of basic building blocks. So one or more axes, so an axes um, looks something like this. This is a 1D histogram and that describes your uh, transformation from data coordinates into bin coordinates. And there's lots of different ones and Hans will be telling you about some of the different ones um, there. You can do lots of different things by selecting different axes. And then you build up your axes and you also have a storage and you have, uh, currently we have seven storages, more may be added using a pull request to add another one. How um, many storages let you do different things with your histogram. They expand this out to a full genera generalized histogram where you could do something like a, um, take a mean, that would be a T profile in, in root. And for us, it's all on the same object, same API, just by, just by this composability. And then you just you have two two axes, and this just generalizes out to two or even even in D. Unlike uh, both root and NumPy, we have the same API for one D and twenty four D. 
Right, very quickly, I'll just show you a drop-in replacement for NumPy. There is a, a drop-in replacement inside that has a NumPy dot histogram. Uh, looks just like NumPy. Um, the edge, ed, there's tiny, tiny differences in the edges um, just because of slightly different algorithms, but they are very close in the same behavior, overall behavior, identical overall behavior. Um, so there's a NumPy histogram. And you'll see that we can actually then still keep the same, same API, but then switch to returning histograms if we want. And histograms themselves can be turned back into the NumPy style outputs. And just to show you why you would want to, to use this, besides obviously being able to switch over to histogram objects, the, um, even for a 1D histogram, which NumPy has highly optimized, you'll see that um, this histogram is roughly twice as fast. And if you're doing a 2D regular binning, this is um, a much, much higher uh, factor between these two. And we get this behavior. This is a highly optimized one just for a regular bin, for this um, regular binning. We get this um, get excellent performance no matter how you mix bins or how large your histogram is. Very quickly show you that this can go up to multiple dimensions. So I'm just going to do a, a first a standard plot. You'll see that these um, objects here, axes objects, are smart. You can actually pull out the x uh, edges as, as a uh, set of matrices. You can even uh, transpose that whole set of matrices and um, apply that to a peak color mesh if you want. Of course, you could also just hand this to MPL uh, HEP. And you can do, um, you can use UHI. So very briefly, we'll actually see this more in the, in the final piece, and I really want to get to that. But uh, there is, and you can look at my previous, my other talk, there's a whole system built here for doing indexing. And it allows you to choose either bin number or if you pass a callable, and there's several of them provided in this histogram, you can um, do this in a different space, such as your um, axis um, data coordinates. So for example, if I do a quick um, just plot here, and then I can just select the range from minus two to zero, which I read off of this plot right here. Um, and I can zoom in on just that part so that now I have just the bins from the negative two data coordinate to the zero data coordinate. I can check the contents of a bin, so I just roughly see where this, this uh, bin is. I can, I can just read off the axis into here, and there I have it. And I can, if I wanted to bin coordinates, so I can just manually figure out what that is, I could just replace this with 60. And that's in bin coordinates. Okay. Um, you can do projections just using sum. So this is looking at this, the 2D, hist uh, 2D histogram. That we looked at earlier. Um, you can zoom in to just a segment of, a, of an image. So this is a really powerful way and you can mix uh, mix and match. You can put these in numbers, you can put these in as the uh, locators. And again you can do this in 2D. All right there's more to say here but uh, I'm just this is just a preview for the, the talk. Feel free to go see that which talks a little bit about how this fits in. So with that let's go ahead and move over to uh, Hans. Hans can you start sharing? Yes. Uh, thank you, Henry. So I will start sharing. Thinking it'll kick me out. Just to make sure. I hope that works. So you see my Jupyter notebook. Yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's go on. So yeah, I don't. Uh, it's already pre-computed everything. So as Henry mentioned, uh, you have many powerful access types, and I want to show you a little bit of this uh, system that we built here, so you can categorize uh, access in, into different groups. So one kind of standard group is continuous access. So that's the usual regular one where the bin width is um, some, equal, uh, some equal width. And um, then we have another continuous access that's variable, that where it's basically the same, but the bins are not of equal size, but they can vary. And um, the performance of these two is different. So when you have a regular access, it's very fast. That's the reason why um, one always wants to use a regular axis if possible. The variable axis is also not bad, but it's uh, not as fast. Um, and to extend the, the usability of this regular axis, um, we have built-in transforms for it. So we can, for example, apply a log transform uh, because we always, I mean, we often do logarithmic binning, and uh, well, you can just use a regular axis for that um, by applying this log transform. And this is shown here uh, as an example. So I make a 2D histogram. 
with uh, two regular axes, but uh, one uses log binning and the other one uses something more exotic, square root binning. And when I fill this two dimension histogram um, and plot it, uh, then it looks like this. So the x axis is the log binning and the square root axis is the other one. It looks kind of similar. If you look closely, you see some differences, but both these kind of binnings uh, make the bins larger and for larger values and smaller for small values. So both useful to uh, bin power load distributions, for example. Yeah, and then you, we also have a feature for, uh, for these regular axes to make it circular. So if you have angles, for example, you can just make uh, an axis that wraps around. And uh, then, for example, you don't have to worry whether your data is in the 2 to 0 to 2 pi uh, format or in the minus pi to pi format. They, it will always work because this thing wraps around. And I did show this here, so I make an axis which goes from 0 to 2 pi, and then I fill it with values from minus pi to pi, and this just works. And you, this is even more powerful. So this system is uh, um, made so that you can even write your own transforms. Uh, you have to compile them with Numba, but it's kind of simple. So when you use the CFUNC decorator, you can make your own transforms. And it's still fast, and so that's the whole point of this. Um, yeah, then there's another type of axis, which we call discrete. So um, we have an axis especially for integer values. Um, so that's an ordered range of integers, and this is super fast. So um, that's also, again, a performance thing. You also have a Boolean axis, which is just a, well, the simplest possible integer axis, where you just have two values, true and false. Um, this is kind of useful, as we will show you. Then we have an integer category axis. So this is also a range of integers, but now they are not continuous. Uh, there can be gaps in between. So this is useful, for example, for PDG ideas when you um, make a histogram of some Monte Carlo particles. And we have a string category, which is uh, yeah, kind of the same thing, but not for ints, but for strings. And uh, these things allow you to organize the data very nicely in high dimensional histograms like this. So I have a, this is a kind of practical example. So we have an axis in PT and one in ETA. And then you have one Boolean axis that tells you whether this was simulated or real data. And uh, maybe you do some selection. And then you can also have another axis that tells you whether this was a candidate that you selected or not. And uh, all this is just this one uh, histogram can hold all this data. And this is arguably much better if you than making four individual histograms for these different things and manage them by hand. And uh, using access for this gives you the combinatorics automatically. So that's pretty cool. And you can also just uh, sub, uh, you can project back into the superset. So if you don't care again uh, at some point whether it was a candidate or not, you just sum over that axis and you get uh, the histogram of all tracks. Yeah, and here's some, as I sh said, uh, if you have used this integer category axis, it's pretty cool. And for Monte Carlo data, just uh, select uh, where some particles and uh, it nicely works with the particle module here. And uh, you can also use this, for example, if you have a range of uh, data taking, you want to look at the different years, uh, then you can do the integer axis for that. Um, yeah, or if you have fields in LHC, you can make an integrity over the fields. And then it, later on, you can always sum over this field. So you can make systematic studies for a year and then in the end, you just sum over this uh, when you want to have a time result on node no issues. Okay, so that's about axis types. And now we go on to accumulators and storages and I have to go a little bit fast. So as Henry already mentioned, we have this mean accumulator and uh, well, I guess I have to go really fast. So, I mean, basically you fill samples into a cell instead of just counting what ends up in the cell. And you do this like, um, ah, okay, well, yeah, okay. I guess I have to skip over this. We have an example, yes. Um, I will also skip over this. So, um, okay, here I make some random data and in X and Y, and I make a scatter plot of this. And uh, then I fill it into a histogram that was loaded with a mean uh, storage, which is then like a profile. That's why I call it profile. So you pass in the X values as in the normal way and the Y values as a sample. And then you can access uh, the, the data with this uh, view. You can access the values in each bin and the variance in each bin. And you can use this, for example, for plotting. And it looks like this. So, I mean, if you're familiar with the deep profile classes in root, and um, as Henry already mentioned, that we have these. And um, root, they only go to three dimensions. And you can have 24 dimensions or whatever you want. 
And we have many more storages and I have, don't have time to, to walk you through, but uh, there are really interesting ones, for example, thread say storage when you want to fill the same histogram from different threads concurrently without making errors, you can use that. Um, okay, I guess I also have to skip over this. So, but maybe if you want to look at the slides, this is a kind of cool, Once. something that is rather complicated, but you can do easily with boost. Once yes? a question about going slower. Yeah, sorry. Slower? Slower. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean slower scrolling or? Slower um, presentation. Ah, okay, but I mean, Henry is going to say a few words, so I, I think I have to finish now with this part. You, you, you still have four or five minutes easily, Hans. Okay. I think you can do this one example because this is a really good one, and then, then I think we can switch. Okay, so then just do this one example. Okay, so here this is a real story. So I used to, I want to show you that you can use boost, boost histograms in, in surprising ways. So I had this problem that uh, there was some table that somebody else produced which gave some efficiencies. And this table was in the kinematic audio, it's momentum and eta. But my binning is, uh, so I also bin my data, but it's in PT and eta. So how I do I transform this table into my coordinate system? Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, this is how this original table looked like. I mean, this is a stand-in, this is not the real table, of course. And uh, so you, the way to do this correctly uh, is to, to take your data set, and you, which has certain distribution in PT and ETA, and then you can compute the other coordinate from that table, the P. And uh, then you have selected so that you only select values inside that original table. That's this mask in here. And then you can use this, this basically one-liner to get all the efficiencies for all these values from your original table, if it's already a boost histogram. And, um, and that's it, then you have the efficiencies and you can fill those efficiencies then again into a profile, a two day profile now, so a, a storage mean in your own coordinates, PT and ETA, and then you get the results. So the other stuff is just for, for plotting. So it's a really, it solves this problem fairly easily. So you might find other cool ways of using this, uh, boost histograms that are really not what you normally would do with histograms. Okay, that's, uh, that's all I think. Thanks so much, Hans. But uh, now, I'm, now I'm confused. Yeah, Hans, yeah. Henry, so you... All right, so now we're moving on to part three. Uh, and this is a first look at HIST. So I'll be importing several things there. So HIST is a Google Summer Code project um, from uh, Joe Liu or Nino, and uh, I've been mentoring him in that. And uh, it's, I think, at a state where we can uh, show it off today. It is an alpha, it is an alpha release, so you'll have to ask for the alpha when you do the install on uh, PyPy. There's an old package called HIST there, and you'll get, you'll get that, which has nothing to do with, um, which doesn't have much to do with this. Okay, so this is a package that's built on top of Boost Histogram. And uh, this is sort of the differences between HIST and Boost Histogram. Uh, Boost Histogram has no dependencies, where dependencies are allowed in HIST. Um, HIST is focused on being clear and, uh, and short and easy to write in a notebook or in a command line or something like that. And uh, HIST has uh, various uh, wrappers and interfaces to other tools. So right now there are four things in uh, HIST that we'll be showing off today. So names, UHI plus, or quick UHI, plotting and quick constructors. So um, in HIST, a, a axis can have a name and a label. Okay. If you use a name with an axis, you can now access it anywhere you, you would use a, um, you, would, you uh, encounter axes and you would use a, a, an integer, you can now use the name instead. So when I fill, I can just, give the, the names, as long as you pick a, a valid identifier in Python for the name, you can just fill it like that. Um, now you don't have to pay attention to what your order is. It's much more, um, uh, so this is much clearer. If I wanted to project to the Y axis, I can just use Y right there instead of the zero. Um, for UHI, UHI has a special um, dict base access, which um, is very similar to X-ray, the way X-ray does its advanced indexing. But if you use that, you can now use um, the uh, names right there. You can even use them inside the axes tuple. The axes tuple now can also can take a number or the name right here. So axis X, 
set the title to x um, to this, set the y title to that. I plot it, and then now you'll see that um, MPL hat picked up those titles and is plotting them uh, here. So it really helps keep your um, your uh, axes organized. There's even this experimental named hist, which is a special uh, hist that forces named access and doesn't let you do things the old way. Um, but that might that's overboard unless you really want really want that. We have one person who really wanted that, um, Nick, I think. Okay, so then uh, I'm going to try the uh, UA, the quick UHI for quick UHI. I'm just going to build a quick little uh, data set and uh, fill it. So this is just a histogram where I just bin, I uh, just throw uh, random numbers at this image and then decide whether they show up or not. So it gives me a fun histogram. So now I can just read off of the labels here. I can read um, negative, or I can read 0.7, and then I just stick a J at the end. Instead of, instead of importing something else from, from HIST, I just stick the J at the end, and that tells me it's data coordinates. So this is 0.7 in data coordinates to the end, and then 0.5 to 0.8, I do that. And now I have zoomed in on just this um, Python head here. Uh, you can do this as well in the um, in the third item here, which is where you would put rebin or slice, and that lets you do a rebin. So this now I've done a uh, rebin, and of course you can mix these any way you want. So you could zoom in um, and rebin. So colon two j colon two j. Okay. So now that's a, a rebin zoomed in image. Okay. Um, if you have strings, then they can also just be accessed. Since you can't put a J after a string, you just use the string itself. So uh, H of A is simply uh, three because there were three A's. Uh, you can even do a range. Uh, and now you get a new histogram that just has those in that range. Okay, so strings work. So J's work after all numeric types and then strings just work directly. Quick plotting is another one. So if you just call dot plot on a histogram object, you get a plot um, with titles and things. Um, there's also a plot, a plot 2D full, which gives you these extra um, histograms around the side for the projections, which is all just very natural to even, the back end is very natural inside this histogram. Um, and you can uh, project using sum there and then plot and slice all in one. And then quick constructors. This is the most experimental thing. This one um, is definitely very hist, a very hist thing to do. Um, but you have quick constructors. So you just call hist dot, and then the names of the axes, and they're all shortened to look like hist. So logs, um, like reg, bool. Uh, they're all short axes names. Helps keep them separate from actually the real axes. And then just call these, and the histogram becomes real. This is actually memory efficient. It becomes real only when you do anything else other than string these together. You don't actually notice there's no ending thing there. Uh, so in the behind the scenes, this is very, uh, um, it's full of magic behind the scenes. Okay, so this is taking a look at the example you just saw from Hans, just showing you what it would look like if you used the um, names, if you used the short constructors. Um, so you can see on a, say if you're on a command line, and then dot plot. Um, I didn't put anything inside this, but you can see the titles have shown up here in the nice little latex. Um, titles here. So you can see how this might be really handy if you're in a command line and then you know later you might put it in and, and expand things out to the, the, the full versions. Uh, and we can just go back and forth between hist and boost histogram. You've got five minutes uh, for, okay. for questions. Yeah? All right let me just run this this demo without saying much about it. But here's, uh, here's everything working together. This is uproot, pulling in data, doing a dot, uh, dot plot, and then I can do dot two hist. Um, oh, I already did two hist. Never mind. And it gets the title plot. And I can do a pull plot very easily and do all my other plots. Done. All right. So, uh, questions? Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Hans and, and Harry. Uh, so we have a few questions, actually. Let me uh, either share it or share it. Give me a second. Um, there you go. Did you have them?
Do you have the questions? Can you see them, uh, Henry? Yes. Uh, I, I can see okay. them. Yeah. So one of the questions, well, actually, sorry, for me, but it comes up in the, in, in the top then. If you, you folks really have a lots of cool stuff there. Uh, I, there's lots of playing that will have to do with, with, with this, but I'm just wondering if for, for plotting, for example, how HIST will, uh, with Evolve will, with the MPL HEP now that you also have plotting and quite powerful plotting in HIST in particular. How you see things evolving there? What I would hope, um, and, and I think it'd be very easy to do on our end, is that we would just um, have MPL HEP as a requirement because HIST can have requirements in like this histogram. And then the uh, core plotting would just would end up being um, handed off to uh, MPL HEP in the back end. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that was sort of developed before uh, MPL supported boost histograms. And uh, so that's why it's sort of, they, they look a little bit different right now, but I think in the, in the long run, they will start looking pretty much the same, except you know, we may add a few things, but we'll start looking the same because we'll just use MPL HEP. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so there's some, some communication involved there, yeah. All right, okay. the, the other one is- uh, Can you either zoom into that or switch to presentation mode? Uh, yeah, I was logged out that for some reason. So in, in order to be fast, I that's why I was sh I was putting. I can this. I can share this in like if you want. I, I can also share the, okay. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I was getting out for whatever. Uh, Hans, do you want to answer the the next question? Uh, sure. Um, should I read it? So, how bad does storage get when you add lots of axes? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, this uh, hits you at some point. The curse of the dimensionality hits you. But this is, for example, why we have this unlimited access, which is memory efficient. So it uses the least amount of memory um, that you could get for, for such a case. And so far I haven't run into actual problems. But yeah, I mean, you can easily make a, a when, you, when you make a 24 dimension histogram with 100 bins per, per axis and you will run out of memory. Um, yeah, so don't overdo it. Um, yeah, in the limit, uh, yeah, at some point, of course, this is the uh, curse of dimensionality thing. So at some point, uh, it makes no sense to have a histogram anymore. You want to have it as, a, as an unbind uh, n tuple or something. But I mean, as we've shown, there are many cases where histogram is super useful and will be much faster. And you don't always have to look at all the bins at the same time. Sometimes you use some bins also just for organizing your data, uh, which you would otherwise use a dictionary for or something. So in practice, it's very efficient so far, I can say. Okay, next next question. So Henry, do you want to do that again? Just, you can alternate. Oh, actually, maybe it's a question for me. So do you do hexagonal binning in 2D? Yeah, we want to. So if somebody uh, comes along and writes us a hexagonal binning algorithm, we can I would be very happy to add an access which does hexagonal binning to boost this program and then, I mean, in C++ and then we, it triples up the chain up to all these other Python versions as well. So it's mostly that uh, nobody got the time yet or took the time yet to, to implement a hexagonal binning algorithm. So I guess I should also answer that one. Uh, uh, how I propagated the weights. So yeah, the, the, the original, well, in my case, it was just efficiency. So, um, well, I, I took the, the efficiency of the original table as weights. And then I used these weights in, um, no, actually I don't even need weights. So um, I use this profile. So the profile computes the average of something in a bin. And uh, as the thing to compute the average of, I just took the efficiencies of the original table. So it's just the average efficiency in my bin. So no weights. Okay, and then so given that all the axes, all the all the axes are possible, could you make a seaborne like layer? Um, possible. You'd have to see how the actual usage would go, but I could definitely see the Boolean axes being sort of um, having sort of an interface to to something that that would. Make something like Seaborn would make sense, especially for something like the Boolean axis. Um, but that would be a little further down the line. But that sort of thing is something that could be put in uh, in HIST. 
I mean, you know, in a way, this is kind of what Matulib has does to to this right now, right? You can just take the hist as you would take a pandas data frame and throw it into Seaborn. You could take the hist and throw it into Matulib. You could probably think of other other methods to to write on top of it. Does, do the display tools support the square transformation? That's actually one nice thing about the, about the way this works because all the display tools come straight off of the axes um, information itself. Then whenever your axes are not regular or square, you know, have transformation, it just works because they're just asking for the edge, the edges, the widths, the centers, and those are correct um, for regardless of what axis you have. It could be variable, it could be, um, um, even the, the categorical just have a standard. They just they just report zero, one, two, three, four, so that you can get a nice thing to plot. So uh, display all the display tools. I didn't have a chance to show it. I've done it in other other talks. Um, you just it's exactly the same code everywhere. Matplot even the matplotlib where you don't touch MPL have that all is the same code. Regardless well, of the axis. Shall, shall we stop here just not to 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 have too much of a, of a delay already in the first presentation for the benefit of everybody else. Uh, I suspect that we're going to have much more discussion in, in the Slack channel, so please please do move your discussions there. I think that, that will be really